Perfect. All right. Well, let's bow our heads for prayer. Let me ask God to be with us as we are about to investigate the Word of God. Here we go. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your grace and mercy. We want to thank you, Father, for not giving us what we deserve, but giving us what your dear Son does. As we're about to open the Bible, as we're about to study Scripture, we realize that of our natural selves, Lord, we do not and cannot understand your word. We are broken and frail people in great need of you, Father. So even now, Father, we ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is the only effectual teacher of truth. We ask this knowing that you could do abundantly above whatever we ask or think, Father. We are in great times of need, Father. And what is the purpose of prophecy unless it has proper impact in our, pro in our practical lives? So please help us, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus and we claim the merits of his holy and most precious blood. Amen. Amen. All right. Wonderful. Well, welcome, everyone. It is time to dig into our Bibles. Time to open the word of God. To let him be our teacher. And tonight, before we get into the actual study itself we're going to do some review we're going to go we're going to review a bit far back all the way to the beginning and then bring us to our our present time and the reason why we're going to go backwards in time to review is because some of those principles that we covered need to be in our in the front of our minds right it needs to be in the in the in the top of the mind awareness they call it toma right top of mind awareness it needs to be right there in the front and so to do that Let's run through a couple of the principles that we've covered when we first started studying this book. So today's topic, we're in lesson number eight. Can you believe that, guys? Lesson eight. That means we have put at least 14 hours of class time in, right? Because we have seven sessions. We do about two hours every time we come together. That's 14 hours. And it doesn't cover the amount of time that you spent privately reading your Bible. It doesn't cover the amount of time that you spent going over the PowerPoint presentation. It doesn't cover the, the time that you spent going over the lesson guides and the charts that were given. So we're putting quite a bit of time. We're putting quite a bit of time into this study because we don't want to just run through the book and say we did the book of Daniel. We want to come out fairly confident, yay confident, <laughs> that we understand what the Bible is teaching and what it means and how relevant it is to our to our lives so today is today's lesson lesson number eight is called lions and bears and leopards oh my <laughs> lions and bears and leopards oh my so let's let's dig in a little bit let's do a bit of review we're going to talk we're going to review this idea of the purpose of prophecy the purpose of prophecy and we're not just making up what prophecy is about we're going to the scripture and scripture is going to instruct us on its purpose the purpose of prophecy so we read in isaiah chapter 42 we read in isaiah chapter 42 in verse number nine behold the former things have come to pass and new things do i declare before they spring forth i tell you of them so god is the one that tells you what's going to happen before it happens and he's the only one that has this ability and power to do this to do it accurately 100 percent of the time we also read in the book of isaiah or john chapter 14 verse 29 and now i have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass ye might believe well there it is again this idea of this faith this trust so jesus says i'm going to tell you before it happens so when it happens you can believe your faith can be strengthened and then we find in john chapter 13 and verse 19 it says now i tell you before it come that when it has come to pass ye might believe that i am he so let me just make this extremely clear for you my friends the purpose of prophecy is to help us come to a place that we learn to believe. And ultimately, our belief is in the person of Jesus Christ. 
There is no purpose of prophecy simply for knowing information purposes. The purpose of prophecy is so that we can learn to believe that our faith can be strengthened for you and I will go through a myriad of challenges in our lives that require Christ to be our anchor. This is key to keep in mind. This is key to keep in the fore of our understanding because life is not easy, friends. It comes with a myriad of challenges. And here in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32, it says of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. So here you have another idea of the purpose of prophecy. It is to know what we ought to do, right? So A, prophecy is given so that we can trust, learn to believe and trust God. B, prophecy is given so that we can learn to trust God with our salvation. C, we are to learn to trust God ultimately so we can know what we are to do. We are not to be guessing at what we are doing in the days in which we live. No guessing required, not at all. So, Deuteronomy 29, 29, and again, highlighting the principle of what we have gone over in Scripture. It says, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So, prophecy is something that belongs to God. Secrets belong to God. If he reveals them to us, then we have a duty, right? Once it's revealed to us, we have a duty. But if we want to know the secrets, if we want to understand the heart of God or the plan of God, we must go to the source, which is God himself, right? We must go to the source. But then we find in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing. Hold on. Recording in progress. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. And this is very clear. God will do nothing, absolutely nothing, unless he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So let's walk this back and make the connection. So if the secrets belong to God and God reveals the secrets unto his prophets, that means God wants us as his children not to have it as a secret, but as a revelation, as an understanding. He wants to reveal his heart to his children. And in so doing, he wants us to walk in the way, the way that reflects the gospel, the way that reflects understanding of the plan of salvation. So I just want you to lock that into your, into your mind. And I want to make sure we uh, read this quotation to you. It's one of the most fascinating quotations that we went over already, but I think it's paramount to do again as we're laying deeply into the prophetic line. It says, in the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear as if dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold above, behind, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one silently, patiently, working out the counsels of his own will please lock that concept in your mind just because donald trump is running for president or joe biden sits in office or some republican or some independent or some democrat holds a position it does not mean brothers and sisters it does not mean that they are in charge it does not mean just because wicked men have control of things in this present world it does not mean that God is leaving this in their hand to Saul. No, not at all. All things working together for God's good, even good men that are in office. And again, I, I do not want to impugn any man's position or influence that he has in the world today. But if you are a man of God or a woman of God or a man of the world or a woman of the world and you hold a position in government, then you ultimately at the end of the day, are working out God's plan, believe it or not. Now, it may not look pretty, but God's going to get it done. 
And the question is, do you understand your role in this great play that we're in? So let's go a little bit further. Let's go a little bit further. In Psalms 25 and verse 14, the Bible says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will shew them his covenant. Now, who's the secret of the Lord with? Those that fear him. Now, the purview of our study today does not go all the way to the book of Revelation per se, but I will reference what an angel says. We call it the first angel that says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So this idea of fearing God, this reverence for God, this awe for God, these type of individuals, God reveals his secrets to. We find this in the experience of Abraham. When Abraham was in the doorway and the three visitors were there and God was about to leave and God said, how can I, how can I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? You see, those that fear God, those that have this deep abiding relationship with God, God must tell his secrets too. So here's my question to you, those of you who are listening. Are you safe with God? To share his secrets with? Is it okay if God shared his secrets with you? Because if you're not safe, you will hear what we present tonight, but you may not fully understand. And that's what I always ask God. Father, I want to better understand your heart. For a prophecy is simply a revelation of his heart. And if I don't understand his heart, maybe I need to clear some stuff out so that he can go deeper in his cleansing process with me. Right? And so you need to ask yourself the question, am I clear with God? Is there more that I need to understand about him? And my friends, I tell you the truth. I know without a doubt for me, it is necessary that I know more about him. What do you, what do you say? Huh? Absolutely, there's more that we must know about him. So let's review these prophet stories. Normally when we do this, I ask you and then you respond. But because we have so much to cover, I'm going to highlight the highlights and then if you have more you want to add, throw it in the chat or raise your hand. You can raise your hand. I just don't want to have any delays because we have quite a bit to get to because Daniel 7 is going to probably take me two days to cover. Two days to cover. And the reason why is because we're going to unpack it and then put it back together. Okay? We're going to unpack it and put it back together. And today, when we study Daniel 7, you're going to see it not like you would in an evangelistic meeting. That's not what we're doing. No. No, no. We're going to do it as if we were Daniel himself. We're going to approach the text as if we were Daniel himself. By God's grace, we're going to do our best to do that. All right, so here it is. So Daniel chapter 1, we had some summary there. This is when the Hebrew boys were taken captive, and God allowed the pagan king to take the, the chosen people of God captive because this was the only way to get the people of God's attention, and this was the best way for the pagan king to get to know God. So God oftentimes and sometimes uses pagan men and pagan women, supposed unbelievers, in order to get our attention and to get theirs as well. There are three steps to reform, and we saw this with the children of with the children of the Hebrew children. The three steps of reform were there was a re-education of the mind, there was a health reform that the king gave to them, and there was a name change that we know had to do with spirituality because those names were pagan names from pagan gods honoring their gods. And so we said, well, the pagan king decided to do something that God himself does. God himself has a re-education. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. God himself tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And God himself has given us names and will give us new names in the kingdom of heaven, reflecting our development of character. So these three, there are three steps of reform that we found in Daniel chapter 1. We also highlighted in Daniel 1, purpose. Daniel and his friends purpose in their heart that they would not defile themselves with the king's meat. This had nothing to do with just it being health or not. It had to do with their bodies being in temple and providing their bodies things that the Most High would be pleased with. And we know that they chose things that grew from the ground 
when making this adjustment. Favor, and we saw favor. Favor is something that everyone has access to. All those who honor God and honor man will receive favor. Remember, the first four of the commandments deal with honor to God, and the last six of the commandments deal with honor and respect to man. So therefore, you can grow in favor and in stature with God and man. Favor is no secret. God's not showing favoritism, only that those who follow what he says will find favor here on earth and in heaven. And you honor God, and God honors you. We saw that when the Hebrew boys honored God, they were honored 10 times wiser, and they stood before the king and gave glory to God in their posture, in their faithfulness to God, God honored them. So those are just some highlights, and I'm quite sure there are many other things that we saw in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 2, what do we see? Dreams are for protection. We saw in Job 33 verses 14 and 15, I mean, 14 through 17, that dreams were given for a protection to hide pride from men. God speaks when we go to sleep sometimes, right? So we saw that. And God is speaks specifically in imagery that you and I would understand. Nebuchadnezzar had dreams about gold and of silver, bronze and of iron. These are all financial elements, kingdom building elements. We see that sometimes God hides things from mankind in order for man to figure out they don't know how to do it. Once they figure out they don't know how to do it, then they can go to God and say, hey, you know what, God, you're right. I don't know what I'm doing. And sometimes God does that to get our attention. We know that God cares because when God gave not only the dream and the revelation of the interpretation to Nebuchadnezzar, he also told Nebuchadnezzar what he was thinking about before he went to sleep. You see, my friends, as God dealt with something specific to Nebuchadnezzar, God did something broad in speaking to us in regards to our situation and our constitution. And then God reveals secrets. We already saw that, and I'm repeating it again. God is the one that, that reveals those secrets. He's the one that sets up kings. He's the one that takes them down. God is sovereign. He is the one that is in control, even in our present day no matter how confusing how strange how crazy it presently is daniel 3 god will stand for you as you stand for him we saw that again in daniel 3 as the hebrew boys are not bowing down to the image we highlighted that the wicked watch the righteous they do this on a regular basis they're doing this right now they're doing this to you and to me are you really who you say you are and if you are who you say you are we're going to try to take you down even more so but they're looking for an opportunity to take you down. So be aware, be diligent, be intentional in your stand for God. The music in Daniel 3 was a cue for false worship. And we made a, a application in the sense that even in this day, music can be used for false worship. And music was parallel in experience to image worship in Revelation 13 because the music and unclean spirits went together to bring worship to a false image in Revelation 13, a test which we all will face here in these last days. And the other thing we brought out was positive declarations are not necessarily conversions. Right? You can you can acknowledge truth and not be converted by that truth. Right? You can say you love God or God is good, he's great, but that does not mean that you're converted. And this is something that we have to recognize because conversion happens in a supernatural way by a God who is able to work in us what we cannot ever work ourselves. All right. Daniel 4. Daniel was full of the Holy Ghost. We went through and showed without question when it talks about him being full of wisdom and understanding and, and counsel and might. These are all aspects of the seven spirits of God, which is the Holy Spirit. We highlighted that. We saw how the pagans looked at Daniel and said, this man is, is full of an excellent spirit. Well, what were they talking about? They were referencing the Holy Spirit. And God's spirit needs to be evident and practical in the experience of the people of God in these last days. Silence and wisdom go together. <laughs> we highlighted that because sometimes when you open your mouth, you remove all doubt that you don't know what you're talking about, right? That's why I got to be careful. As I'm talking to you, I'm saying, Father, let me just tell the truth. Don't want nothing coming out of my mouth sideways. 
right? But sometimes in silence, there is wisdom. And so Daniel, as he stood before the king, and as the, the dream was not in the quote-unquote king's favor, he said, let me not be swift to speak this in a way that will incite uh, some type of fury or the thought that he's not for him. And then we highlighted this idea that there is no limit to the usefulness of one who sets themselves aside to be used by the Spirit of God. And then we have this idea that we are trees. And the idea of trees is this kingdom. Nebuchadnezzar, you are of this tree. And underneath your boughs of this tree, everybody's going to be taken care of. And we all have a, a, a semblance of a tree in our own experience where people benefit from our experience as long as we are connected with God. And at the end of the day, Nebuchadnezzar, in his own words, in his own language, said, God alone deserves the glory. Nebuchadnezzar himself was preaching, if you would, the first angel's message. Daniel 5. Handwriting is on the wall, but only the wise understand. So everybody can see right now. There's, there are a few people that look in the world and say, oh, everything's hunky-dory. Everything's fine. Everything's copacetic. No, no. There, few people talk like that. People in the world today can see that there are problems in this world. Everybody can see it, but not everybody can interpret what is happening. But the wise understand. Those who are obedient to the will of God and the word of God find understanding there. Again, we're talking about Daniel having an excellent spirit. We highlight this idea that sometimes you won't be invited to the beginning of the party. Hmm? Some folks be like, hey, you're too boring. <laughs> you, you, you cramp in our style. You're not, you're not part of our crew. We don't need to take offense at that. Sometimes we just need to keep it moving, knowing that when the time is right, we're going to be invited to the party, but it won't be for that reason. It will be to interpret that handwriting that's on the wall. The other, far, other major point that we learned in Daniel 5 is that we need to learn the lesson of our forefathers, right? Uh, this young king, Belshazzar, did not, was not humble and learning from his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. And in so doing, his time, his probationary time, was much shorter than his grandfather. We also highlighted this idea that we do not blend the sacred and the profane. When you do that, judgment comes. It is fairly quick when the sacred and the profane are blended together. All right, Daniel 6. And we're going to do this quickly, man. I mean, mind you, each one of these chapters, we took two hours to unpack line by line, verse by verse. Daniel 6. Faithfulness is not limited by age. Daniel was faithful when he was a teenager. Daniel's faithful when he's 90 years old. You can be faithful and walk with God day by day. You don't have to wait till you get old to do it. You don't, you don't give up because you're older and you don't wait, you know, you don't start late. You start as young as you can, and you build that deep abiding relationship, all right? It's, it's so important, so powerful, so intentional. All right, here we go. We're almost done here. The wicked, watch the righteous. We highlighted that again. Beware of the flatterer. Beware of the flatterer. People that will be like, oh, that was a great study. That was a great Bible study. That was a great sermon. Oh, you're so... You're so handsome. You're so pretty. Oh, you're so intelligent. Let's do this for you. Like, careful with that. Just be careful. The Bible teaches to be careful in regard to these things. When the king was flattered, that's when he made the rule that no one worship any god but himself. And, and in so being deceived by his own pride, he put his friend in jeopardy. Right? So we don't want that experience at all. Not at all. So be careful with that there a test is required and what I, what do i mean by that sometimes others will not understand the gravity of your faith until they see you tested and it's under the duress under the duress of your temptation and your trial that others begin to see and believe in the god that you serve so don't buckle under the test don't melt under the heat of the spotlight under that time frame, understand and know that in that moment, the Most High trusts you to trust Him to work through you. All right? 
So keep that in mind. And lastly, but not least, God is faithful. God kept Daniel. He shut the lion's mouth and no harm came to him. Not even a whiff of a uh, anything that wasn't savory, right? Very good. So, all right. So those are that's our summary of the prophet stories. There's much more there. If you're doing the summary that I gave you assignment to do, you probably came up with some others of yourself. Again, all this is review. All right. We talked about a chiastic structure. Uh, this is a, 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 a writing methodology used within the Hebrew mind. And so what we did was we looked at Daniel 1. We summarized it in one word. Now, you can use your own word. I'm giving you something that's simple to understand. Like, so the whole book of Daniel, you can understand in eight points. Okay, simple, right? So Daniel 1 is about undefilement. Daniel said, I will not defile this temple, his body temple. Uses the same word that you would use if you're talking about the physical temple built with stones and tents and things like that. Daniel 1, I will not defile the temple. Daniel 2, is about succession, succession of kingdoms, the rise and fall of kingdoms. Daniel 3, the focus of that chapter is worship, the test of worship, the test of worship. Daniel 4 is dealing with the issue of pride. Okay, Daniel 1, again, the Hebrew boys are taken captive. Daniel 2 is the vision of the image. Daniel 3 is the is the vision of the image in Daniel 2. Daniel 3 is about the worship of the, of the image in Daniel 3. And Daniel 4 is about self-worship, <laughs> pride in Daniel chapter 4, all right? All these actually deal with pride, but we'll just keep it moving for now. Daniel 5, handwriting on the wall. Again, the question is brought, the, the very story from Daniel 4 is brought into Daniel 5. Again, the major focus is pride. Pride, pride, pride. And then the comparison in Daniel 6 is again about worship. The image worship in Daniel 3, man worship in Daniel 6. And then Daniel 7, which we're going to be covering today, will deal with the succession of kingdoms. And you're going to see how that applies. Again, everything right now is review. And you have these charts. Those of you who are in our class, you have our charts. If you would like to be in our class, you're watching this video, send me a message. And I will help you get into the resource section of our class. Okay. So here is a parallel. So we have a pattern. Daniel 3, there's a test. There's a punishment, there are spies, deliverance, the leadership acknowledges God, there's a message that's sent to the nation, and then those evildoers are punished. So in Daniel 3, what do we have? Image worship. What was the test? Uh, the other test, man worship for Daniel 6. In Daniel 3, we had fiery furnace. That's the punishment if you did not worship the image. In Daniel 6, it was the lion's den if you did not follow man's dictum, his law regarding worship. In Daniel 3, there were certain Chaldeans. In Daniel 6, these are the presidents that were looking out and trying to entrap Daniel. Okay? In fact, let me do this. I'm going to make this bigger. All right. All right, in Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar makes a declaration acknowledging the God of heaven. In Daniel 6, Darius makes a decree and a declaration to all of the area uh, to the, and acknowledging the God of heaven. There's a message sent to all nations, the entire kingdom. And the punishers themselves, the soldiers that threw Dan Daniel, I mean, the Hebrew boys in the fiery flame died. And the conspirators who threw, who, who, who entrapped Daniel were thrown in the lion's den. So what is the end time parallel? It's very easy. When you look at Revelation 13 through 19, you have image beast worship. You have the punishment is you won't buy or sell, and you could be killed. You have the spies, our kings and leaders and covenant breakers. These are the individuals that turn folks in. Deliverance of those who are sealed with the seal of God. All acknowledge Jesus as Lord. That every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. 
And there are three angels, plus the fourth angel that sends a message to the entirety of the world. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are cast together into the lake of fire who come up against the people of God. You see, the parallels are here. We did not make up this story. This is here in the scripture. All right. Daniel 4 and 5, similar experience here. This pride, declaration, declaration of judgment, God's representative, the fall, ruling king, and the message. What's the, the pride of declaration? Is this not great Babylon that I have built? That's pride. Daniel 5, what do they do? They praise the gods of gold and of silver. Again, pride. What's the declaration that comes after that? You will eat grass. What's the declaration of those who, who do praise the gods of gold and silver? Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Okay, you, you're seeing the parallels. They're easy to see. They're right there in the text. And all, you, all we're doing, my friends, we're laying everything on the table. Everything's laid out here so you can see with your own eyes. Ruling king. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was the ruling king. Belshazzar is the ruling king in Daniel 5. And then we have the first angel's message in Daniel 4. And then in Daniel 5, we have Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. So those parallels are very, very, very interesting. In Revelation 13, there's a question mark raised as if who is able to make war, you know, with this, with this, uh, this great beast? Same question that was raised with Goliath, right? Who's going to fight this uncircumcised Philistine? Like the question is raised, but nobody really has the gumption to fight against this power. And then there's a declaration, Babylon is fallen. And then we have this group of 144,000, which we'll study at a different time with a different focus. And then we have the fall, Babylon falls. The river Euphrates is dried up, just like in the Old Testament in Daniel 5. The kings of the earth, and then we have the, being the ruling, the ruling kings of the kings of the earth. And then we have the third and three angels' messages plus the fourth angel. All this is an indication of a pattern. You can see it yourself. You can see that we've summarized much of what we've gone through. But if you begin to see the Bible like this, what's going to happen is when you're having a conversation or someone's telling you something, you'll be able to have a framework to reference, right? And you'll be able to say, hey, you know, actually in Daniel 4, it brought this out. In Daniel 5, somebody says there's no such thing as the, the judgment. Well, then you'd be like, okay, well, this is what it says here. This is what it says here. Here's the patterns of where you find all these principles in scripture. There's a reason why we're taking so much time to lay this out. Okay, so now let's get to Daniel chapter 7, okay? That was a lot. Before I go to Daniel 7, are there any questions or observations from previous prophet stories or previous chapters? Any questions or observations? Now, what your question needs to be fit in the context of what we're talking about, in the context of our class, um, and observations directly from passages that we've studied in Daniel. So any questions or observations that you have, you can throw it in the chat and or you can raise your hand and I'll be happy to take your question if I can hear you. Any questions or observations? It's a lot. We just did a like a that was a lot to give in this few moments of time. No, no questions. All right, here we go. Let's put our uh, let's put our thinking caps on here. So we're in we're in Daniel chapter seven. So you have your Bible open to Daniel chapter seven. Let's begin, and I'm going to say one more word of prayer because this is not necessarily easy, but it's easy. <laughs> and mind you, the our approach to this chapter is going to be a little different than how you have approached it in an evangelistic meeting because it's so important that we take our time and get the basis for what's transpiring okay so let's have one more word of prayer and let's dig in father we have come to a point now where we're about to dig into our study for tonight we've covered a lot summarized in 30 minutes just now 
But Lord, uh, as we're about to dig into the nitty gritty of Daniel 7, we pray for wisdom, understanding, simplicity, and depth. And we pray this not because we are smart enough or intelligent enough, but because you are worthy and hold the secrets of these passages, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So in Daniel 7, verse 1, we'll start there. I'm going to take a volunteer reader. Daniel 7, verse 1 and verse 2. Someone go ahead and read these for us. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. All right. So what we're going to do, we're going to ask some questions. And you're going to answer by God's grace. So here's the question. And thank you. Thank you for reading. I appreciate it very much. What did Daniel have upon his bed? What is what is he having? What is what is happening to Daniel while he's upon his bed? Dreams and visions. That's right. He's having dreams and he's having visions while he's laying upon his bed. And what did the four winds of heaven strive upon? What does it say they strove upon? The great sea. The great sea. Now, I'm going to show you something that you may have not seen before. I'm going to show you first from the Old Testament. Then I'm going to show you from the New Testament. Okay? So first from the Old Testament, we're going to define what he's seen. Because this is imagery. This is images. These are not, this is not a literal thing that he's, he's, he's going through. These, these images mean something. I guess that, that's what I mean to say. This, this means something. So let's go to the book of Isaiah. Hold your hand in Daniel. We're going to the book of Isaiah, chapter 17. And we're going to look at verse number 12. I, Isaiah 17, verse 12. And you're going to have this in your, in your study guide. And there's a chart that I'm going to show you as well. There's going to be many ways that we slice Daniel 7, my friends. Like when we're done with Daniel 7, your brain may feel like it's on overload, but you're going to have all the information you need to properly understand this segment. So Isaiah chapter 17, verse 12, the Bible says, Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas. And to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters. But God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind. Isn't that interesting? And like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Hmm. Anybody else get that? Mm -hmm. So based on Isaiah chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, what could we say that the great winds represent? Nations. Correct. The great winds represent people, nations. So when we see that he's sleeping upon his bed and he sees these winds stirring on the waters, we can see that these winds are stirring up the people or stirring up nations. Isn't that nice? I like, I like how the Bible does that. Now, mm -hmm. you, this is Old Testament. Now, is there a New Testament application of the same idea? Go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 17. And I want you to look at verse number 15. I believe that's where I want to go. Yes. All right. Again, we're highlighting this idea of what does it mean to be the great sea. In Revelation 17, verse 15, the Bible says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the great horse sitteth, 
are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So we have two passages that highlight the same principle, one in the Old Testament and one in the New, highlighting that these great sea is a symbol of a multitude of people or nations. All right, I think that's clear. I think that's clear. Now what we're going to do, we're going to identify winds. We're going to identify winds. Now, someone find for me and read for me Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse 36. Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse 36. Someone have it, just read it for me. What does it say? Against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. They shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. All right, so let's take an observation of the text, okay? We're just going to observe what are the, what is the impact of the winds. So first ask that question. What is the impact of the winds? The impact of the winds that come from the four quarters of heaven are called to scatter the people of God to all four quarters. So the winds cause a scattering. That's what the text says. Let's go to Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 6. So one of the things when we do, in fact, I'm going to tell you right now, our How to Study the Bible class is coming up April the 9th. It's going to be on Sunday mornings. Uh, our Daniel class is still going to continue. But I just want you to know that's coming here shortly. Details are coming probably tomorrow as we put it out. But in Zechariah, Zechariah, Malachi, Zechariah, Malachi. So Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 6. Someone go ahead and read that for us as soon as you have it. Go ahead and read it for us. Zechariah 2. In verse 6. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, says the Lord. For I have spread you abroad like the four winds of heaven, says the Lord. All right, so you get this idea. Again, the winds cause a spreading or a scattering. Okay? There's an uneasiness taking place. Go to Ezekiel chapter 37. Look at verse 9. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 9. Again, we're looking at the impact. The impact. Now, this is interesting. Ezekiel 37 verse 9 says, Then saith he unto me, Prophesy unto the four, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. Also, so come from the four winds. So that means... It's coming from a direction, from certain parts of the earth. Come from the four winds. So we know that the winds, when they blow, they cause a scattering. But it's also now saying, come from the four winds. That's interesting. Let's go a little bit further. Matthew 24 and verse 31. Matthew 24 and verse 31. Look at this. Matthew 24, verse 31, the Bible says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. But it's interesting. So four winds have to do with direct, or the, the where they're coming from has to do with direction. So he's gathering from the four winds. So there's a scattering to the four winds, and there's a gathering from the four winds. Okay? Mark chapter 13, verse 27. Look at this. Mark 13, verse 27. Again, Jesus is speaking because it's in red. The Bible says, And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. So there's a gathering 
from four winds. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. Look at this. Everybody's familiar with this. Revelation 7 verse 1. Notice what the Bible says. Revelation 7 verse 1. It says, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. Interesting. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth, and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So let me just pause here and emphasize. When the four winds blow, they can cause hurt. Everybody get that? When they blow, they cause hurt. And when they blow, they scatter. They scatter to the four corners of the earth. But there's a point in which they will be people will be gathered from those four corners of the earth. And we saw in one section in particular, I believe it was e, I think it was Ezekiel 37 or Zechariah 2. I can't remember which one it was. But this gathering was to gather out of Babylon. That's part of it. Okay? But let's go a bit further. Daniel 8, verse 8. So all we're doing is drawing principle. We're not making an application per se at the moment. We are laying a principle. We're looking where, where the Bible uses this phraseology, how it's used, and then we can garner a principle. Principles can be applied across the board, all right? But we first have to find the principle. So in Ezekiel Daniel, Daniel 8, verse 8. Uh, my fingers are turning too many pages at once. The Bible says, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Let's talk about directions now. Okay? For, towards the four winds of heaven. Direction, where, where it's spreading to. Daniel eleven four. So let's read this here. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven. Towards the four winds. Directional. So when the winds blow from the four quarters of the earth, is causing confusion and conflict and war in the nations. That's what it's doing. Now, let me ask you this. If a wind blows, are we talking about literal winds? Or we or or are we talking about if 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 a nation comes and fights and another nation comes and fights this is this is where the wind comes from this is where warfare comes from wind is not blowing for the sake of blowing we're not talking about literal winds we're talking about strife and confusion and bloodshed this is what is causing these beasts to come up out of the sea out of these nations out of these people okay i, I just want you to have that locked into your mind so that's just that's just Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. Let's go to 3 and 4. And, oh yeah, 3 and 4. Go ahead and someone read that for us. My, 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 my favorite reader today. Go ahead and read that for us, sis. Daniel 7, verses 3 and 4. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it all right so this is an interesting um image because normally there are no such thing as lions with wings everybody agree that's not normal yes okay and then the idea that a lion stands up on its on its feet and then a heart of a man is 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 given to it instead of a heart of a Instead of a heart of a lion, okay? This is a very, very interesting imagery. Intentionality mm -hmm. is here, and again, we need to pay attention to it. Uh, but we're not going to take too long because you're going to see something else. I want to show you something. Before I go any further with this, I need to show you something. And give me a moment to do that. Um, let me pull it up. 
And in the meantime, I'm going to just put the screen on myself. And then I'm going to pull up a document and uh, show you this document. And everybody that's in the class will have access to this document. So, boom. This is an interesting document to me. Because what we're going to do, even now, before I even go through any more of the PowerPoint, I want to make sure that you begin to understand the method of study that we're going to use first. Okay. Uh, what I did was I took the language of the interpretation and or the language of the vision itself and then gave the interpretation based on other passages within the text. And I want to make sure, and I, I was impressed to do this, so I'm going to do it right now. I want to do this before I go through the rest of the PowerPoint. And what time is it? It is, whoa, 8 o'clock already. Can you imagine that, guys? That is crazy. We just started. There's not enough time on planet Earth, I'll tell you that. All right. So you'll see on the left-hand side where we have the actual vision. So we already talked about the four winds. We talked about the great sea. We have the interpretation from Isaiah. We have the interpretation from Revelation. Now we're talking about this was the first, the first line. Now the reason why we're going to do this, friends, is because we're going to act like we're Daniel. Well, we're not going to act like we have the knowledge. Like there's so much more knowledge that we have today than Daniel had in this moment in time. So we're going to act like Daniel right now. We're going to go with what is present before us. Okay. So here it is. Daniel 7, 4. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given it. Now here's the interpretation that was given by the angel. Here's the interpretation. The great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. In other words, the angel did not take time to explain the first, the first beast. I want you guys to observe what, I'm, what Daniel's observing. When Daniel's troubled, he's trying to figure out what this dream means. The angel does not take time to explain to him what this first beast is about. He just says, these great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Over here in Daniel 7, 5. I beheld another beast, a second like a bear. And it raised itself on one side. And it had three ribs in the mouth between the teeth of it. And they said unto it, unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Here's the interpretation by the angel. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. <laughs> you see that? He's not. The angel is not spending a lot of time here. Then he goes again. After this, I beheld another, lo, another like a leopard, which had a, upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given it. Here's the interpretation. The great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. The angel does not spend a lot of time explaining these things, because this is not the concern of Daniel. Now, mind you, we are going to take our time and explain as much of it as we can. But I want you to understand that the emphasis, the emphasis should be placed where the emphasis of the text placed it, right? I'm not going to emphasize something that the text does not emphasize. The text emphasizes something, and we will follow that emphasis here in a moment. So watch this. So here it says, after this, I saw the night vision to be held a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. This is verse seven, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had 10 horns. Look at Daniel 7, 17. The great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. That's the interpretation. Now watch what it does when it defines beast. Now verse 23 says, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. So now there's a bit more explanation given to the fourth beast 
because this is this is the emphasis. This is the concern of Daniel. And you're going to understand why. Look at verse 19. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. You see? Verse 19. So in verse 17, verse 18, we're not spending a lot of time explaining all these other ones. But the fourth beast, Daniel says, I want to know the truth about this beast. Now, why does Daniel want to know the truth about the fourth beast? Now, my friends, let me let me be very, very, very plain with you. This is pivotal. Like the point we're about to make right now is pivotal to understanding the rest of the prophecies. Because you're going to begin to see Daniel having emotional, intellectual, and physical responses to the prophecy. You're going to see, and he's particular. Tell me the truth about the fourth beast. Don't tell me about the, I don't know, uh, the first one, okay, cool. Second one, I, I, it's there. It's kind of weird, but I get it. Third one, okay, yes. But the fourth one, I want to know about that one. Now, my friends, I'm going to, I'm going to emphasize to you here. This is important to know because the Bible is emphasizing it. And you'll notice also, and I'm going to, I'm going to share this with you as well. The emphasis is not on the names of the empires here. That's not the emphasis. It's on the character of the empire. It's not the emphasis of the names of the empires. We're going to name them tomorrow. I'm going to name them. We're going to name them. Uh, I believe tomorrow. If it's not to not tomorrow, I mean next Sunday. I believe we're going to name them, depending on how far we get. But we're going to use the Bible to name them. Okay, so you don't have to guess at anything that we're doing here. But what we're going to do is lay the clues on the table so you are clear on what's happening. So here the question is. Verse 19, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and the ten horns that were in his head. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So verse Verse uh, 24, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. So that that is, okay, here we go. That's the emphasis. So again, Daniel 7, 19, 20, and, and Daniel 7, 12 are referencing the same power. And Daniel wants to know the truth of this fourth beast. And the answer is given on this side, right? But let's go a little bit further. 7, 8 says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, but for whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man. Now, friends, we're going to look carefully at what that means, eyes like the eyes of man. We're going to look carefully at that. And a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Now, Again, what is the interpretation? It says right here, and another shall arise after them, speaking of the horn, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So we see here, the angel interprets the horns as kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand, until a time, times, and dividing of times. Well, that's very interesting. Now, there, there, there's some details there that we will explore. And we will break down. But what I'm showing you here is that there's a vision on the left side. And there's an interpretation given on the right side. There's a mouth speaking great things on the left side. And there are speaking great words against the Most High as the interpretation on the right side whose look was more stout than his fellows on the left side and the part where it says he shall be diverse from the first on the right side, right? Even of the horn that had eyes. Interesting. Again, emphasizing this, he has eyes. He has eyes. Verse 21 says, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. What do you mean made war with the saints? And prevailed against them. Verse 25 says. Uh, Wear out the saints of the most high. 
think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and dividing of times. Now, I'm putting a lot on the table. But the point of me doing this is not so that you would understand everything right now. The point of me doing this is to show you there's an interpretation. I mean, there's a vision and there's an interpretation given by the angels. Look at verse number Daniel 7, verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Jump down. The judgment is set, and the books are open. Daniel 7, 26 references this judgment. The judgment shall sit. The judgment shall sit. So there's this, there's this succession of empires or, or imagery. And I'm going to say empires. This imagery. We know that these, these images represent kingdoms because they're coming up out of the people. We know that. And as they're coming up out of the people... There are challenges, particularly to the people of God. This is why Daniel is focused on the fourth beast. Because it's this beast that makes war with the saints and prevails against them. It's this idea that provokes Daniel to be troubled in his very being. Okay? So, let's go a little bit further. It says, verse, verse 11, Daniel 7, 11, I beheld because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. What's, what's the correlation to that? And they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So Daniel 11, 7, 11, Daniel 7, 26 is the interpretation. Okay? And it just goes back and forth, back and forth like this until... We get to the end. So for now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to come out of this. We're going to reshare my screen here. And we're going to go back to our PowerPoint. So here we go. We answered this question already. This is the, this is the way that we, we normally study this. So we're going to do it this way for now. And then we're going to go back and forth. So we answered this question already. What does the C represent? According to... Isaiah 17, verses 12 and 13, the great sea represents peoples and nations. Who or what do four beasts represent? We just highlighted that. They represent kingdoms. They are four kings who are in charge of kingdoms. You cannot be a king if you don't have a kingdom. Amen. <laughs> That's simple. Okay. Now, what is the significance of eagle's wings? Eagles wings. Talk to me a little bit. What do, what would eagles wings? And we're going to speak specifically when I say eagles wings. I'm specifically speaking in regards to nature. Okay, go ahead, brother Carter or sister Carter. I don't know which Carter it is. Carter family. What's your answer? Hold on. Let me see where you at. Where are my participants? Go ahead, my friend. I'm mute. Okay, let me see. All right, no answer? Okay, uh, apparently that's not working. So, anyone else, what is the significance of eagle's wings? Why is that important? What, is, what do you do with wings, family? What do you do with wings? Monica says fly. That's right, you fly. You fly with eagle's wings. Uh, this is significant for that purpose. Is that the Carters? Go ahead, Car brother, sister Carter. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Uh, I'm not hearing them. All right. So you fly. So Deuteronomy 28 verse 49 says this, and I want to make sure everybody follows this idea. Deuteronomy 29 verse 28 verse 49. And sometimes stating the obvious, my friends, keeps us from making up stuff. It says, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce continents which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. This was a prophecy 
that was given to Israel, letting them know that if you apostatize, I'm going to send a nation that's going to move as swift as an eagle would fly. And they would be fierce and they would surround Jerusalem. This is exact. This is exactly what happened with the kingdom of Babylon. Okay. So wings are for speed. Yeah. They're for flight and they are for speed. So if the lion has his wings plucked, that means the speed is taken away. The swiftness is gone. Right. And then it says he's made to stand on his feet like a man and a man's heart was given it. Why is it significant? Speaking specifically about nature. Now, why is it significant that a lion stands on his feet like a man? What is the significance of that? Yeah. Say it again, Sister Monica. Speak directly into your, your mic. Yeah. Oh, type, type it in the chat because I'm not, for some reason, I don't know why I'm not hearing you and you sounded so good earlier when you first got on. Say it again. Try it again. Speak directly into your computer. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not hearing you, sis. Okay. Okay. So that sister Diana says, I don't know why I can't see you in the full screen. But as one of the whole list of participants. Ramona says that's unusual. I I don't know what I should do, <laughs> but I see everybody's name. <laughs> oh, you see, you I see. I want to see you in full screen. Okay, so what you want to do at your top right hand side, there should be a button that says view. If it depends if you're on a computer or on the phone. Uh, okay, view. Then what do I do after view? And click speaker. Okay, speaker. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. You're, oh, you're, you're welcome. Okay, so my, here's my question, family. And I want you to think about what I'm saying. Why is the lion made to stand on his hind feet like a man? Is this good? It, is that natural for a lion to do? Yes or no? Well, that would be no. Right? No. Okay. What is vulnerable? When a lion or a cat or a dog or anything stands on its hind feet, what's what's vulnerable? Right? It's it's the organs, right? The organs of the body are vulnerable. You know, those when you see a cat lay down on his belly and puts his or a dog lay on his belly and puts his paws up, that's vulnerable. He's ticklish and all that. He he can't really defend that like that, right? So on the hind feet, the vulnerable areas are more so protected. The rib cage comes over and protects on the outer side. You have the back, the backbone you know, on his back, but underneath, that's vulnerable. That's not the safest place for a lion. So it's indicating a vulnerableness. Now, if I said someone had a lion's heart, what would you tell me? What would you tell me about a lion's heart? Would that be how would you describe a lion's heart? If somebody's lion-hearted, was it courageous? Courageous. That's that's the word you would use. If you're talking about having a lion's heart, but the Bible says a lion's heart was taken out of it and a man's heart was given to it. So there's a change in his posture. There's a change in his position. He no longer is beast like, but he's changed in his imagery, my friends. Uh, you know, I believe and you don't have you don't have to take my word for it, but you can just think about it. I want you to think about it. I think this is highlighting a conversion experience. It's highlighting a conversion experience. It's also, whether it's conversion to God or a conversion to a no longer being a, a massive threat as it was, but it's highlighting a conversion experience. Okay? So I just wanted to keep that in mind. This is an observation. Notice this for the next part here. In Daniel 7, verse 5, what do we see? Daniel 7, verse 5 says these words. And uh, can I get a reader to read that for us? Daniel 7, verse 5. Daniel 7, and verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, 
It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour my flesh. All right, so what we see here is a bear. It's on one side, it's higher than the other. It has three ribs in its mouth. That means it had a good meal, right? <laughs> uh, between the teeth of it. And there is instruction given to it to arise and devour much flesh. Now, again, one of my new rules when I study my Bible is to study nature. So whenever nature is presented, whether it's a lion, a bear, a leopard, eagle's wings, ribs, I'm observing with my spiritual eye characteristics that I don't want to bypass, right? So again, I'm not going to make an application on what the raise up on one side means yet because we have Daniel 8 to get to and I want to make sure we cover all of that. But I want you to make the observation that the bear is lopsided. The bear does have three ribs and it is a destructive in destruction mode. Every creature that you see in Daniel 7 so far is a predator. Every creature that you see in Daniel 7 so far is a predator, and it is an unclean creature, meaning that if you were to eat meat, according to the Jewish law, bear would not be one that you would eat. Lion would not be something that you would eat based on the laws of the Hebrews, right? These are unclean creatures predatory creatures that we see in Daniel 7. Again, an observation that you want to keep note of when we go to Daniel 8. Okay, let's take it a bit further here. Why is the bear rate described as being raised up on one side? It's a question that you need to keep in mind, for we will address it uh, in detail uh, in our future, in our study um, next Sunday. Now, why three ribs? Again, a question that we will cover in detail in our next study. Now, what is the description of the beast in Daniel 7, verse 6? It says in Daniel 7, verse 6, And after this I beheld in Loa another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given it. Why four wings? Why a leopard? Why a leopard? Why four heads? Okay. Excellent questions. Well, why why are all these things being described the way they're being described? In fact, let me ask you this. Just the characteristics of a leopard. What is the most prominent characteristic of a leopard? What, what is it? It's quickness. That's right. It's speed. Mm -hmm. But there's another prominent one too. Somebody said it's spots. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you have speed and it's spots. Why are the spots so significant when it comes to this beast of prey? Excuse me. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna assume you said, Sister Monica. I'm gonna assume that you said. Is so it can hide, so it can camouflage itself. That's that's. You said that. No, oh, you didn't say that. I don't. I, I I can't hear what you're saying. Yeah. So that's why you have the body of a leopard. The leopard has a body, so that it camouflages. Oh. So it it camouflages. So it's it's a beast of prey. It sits there. You can't see it. And then when it's ready to pounce, it pounces very quickly. There's a reason why I'm going over the details of this image of imagery with you, my friend. You're going to see it in a minute. So the body is the body of a leopard. When you look at a bear, what do you think of a bear? You don't think of bears being fast, even though they are fast. Bears are strong. They are, they devour. When you look at a lion, what do you think of a lion? He's a he, he's the king of the jungle, right? That's what you're thinking about. And then when it has, instead of two wings, it has four wings, which means it is very fast. So you got a leopard that's naturally fast. Then it has not two wings, but four, which means it's extremely fast. So whatever kingdoms that are going to be applied to the imagery are going to have to match the description given in scripture and by nature 
uh, when it when it comes to those kingdoms. Okay, so Babylon's we already know Babylon is is the first one because it moves with speed and alacrity as it takes over the kingdoms of the earth. Uh, we know that there was conversion took place in Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. We know that a, a man's heart was given it. Again, it could go either way as far as how we interpret that. And then uh, the bear, we're not really touching that at the moment. I will get to it. And the leopard, we're we're touching it, but we're not we're not interpreting it at at the moment. Okay, as far as who it is, just the characteristics. We're approaching this like Daniel would. Daniel did not know all these kingdoms when this vision came to him. Okay, all right. Let's go a little bit further. So here here's the imagery of this leopard with wings. This one only has two wings, which is a bad picture. It should have four wings. Now that I look at it, this is not a biblical picture. <laughs> Okay. All right. So now we get to this dreadful and terrible beast. This is the one that caught the attention. And my friends, you need to make sure that you are attentive to the details. Attentive to the details. So let's describe Daniel 7 verse 7. Let's describe Daniel 7 and verse 7. Here it is. Uh, it says, after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So this fourth beast, as it's described here, is terrible. Please don't listen to anyone that says it's a nondescript beast because it has a description. It doesn't have any likeness. It doesn't say it's a leopard. It doesn't say it's a lion. It doesn't say it's a bear. This beast is a beast that, that cannot be equated to anything that's ever been seen before, except that it has horns. All right. So, again, emphasizing just a couple of correlations or a couple of details. Dreadful, terrible, strong exceedingly. Iron teeth, great iron teeth. Devour, break in pieces, stamp the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. It has a different characteristic, has a different application. Important to keep in mind. Okay, verse 8. Let me, before I go there, yeah, let's look at verse 8. How I says, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. So, again, we're just putting it on the table. How many horns are here initially? How many horns? How many horns are there initially? What do you see? That's right, 10. Initially, there are 10 horns. 10 horns, initially. There's a little horn now that plucks up three by the roots. By the roots. And when we do our study next Sunday, I'm going to go into detail. I'm going to tell you who the three are. I'm going to give you historical references so you can have it locked in. We don't have to guess at anything. What we have to do is observe the text. That's what we have to do. Before we make any applications, before we say this is this power and this power, let's observe the text. Let the text speak for itself. Okay. Let's go a bit further. Let's see. Verse. Before we go there, let's do this. I want to I wanna pull up this document again. Okay, you guys can see this at the bottom. I made a, a supplement. See, I made a supplement so you could see this here. Let's deal with the eyes of man for a moment. All right, so the eyes of man, look at this. Proverbs 16, 2 says, all the ways of a man are clean in his what? His own eyes. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. Then it says, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. 
Proverbs 21 verse 2 says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. You guys see that? So when it says he has eyes like the eyes of a man, that means he sees things the way he wants to see them. Whatever this power is, sees it through the eyes of a man. But ultimately, God is the one that brings judgment when people look through their own eyes. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 2 says, Son of man, thou dwellest in the midst of a rebellious house, which have eyes to see and see not. They have ears to hear and hear not, for they are what? A rebellious house. Job 10 verse 4 says, Hast thou eyes of flesh? Or seest thou as man seeth? That's a question. That's a question. And, uh, again, why does he? Why does the Bible describe this power has having eyes like the eyes of men? This horn has the eyes like the eyes of men because it's man's wisdom, man's philosophy, man's ideas. Is not the issue that Nebuchadnezzar had? Is not this great Babylon that I have built? Man's philosophy, man ideas. Hell and destruction are ever are never full. Watch this. This one got me. Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never, what's it say? Are never satisfied. Interesting. An interesting characteristic to add to the eyes of man. Interesting, my friends. Look at this. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into, what's it say, my friends? into judgment so the mere fact that the bible says this horn has eyes like the eyes of man indicates that this power is going to be brought into judgment that's just you can just get that in the context of the reading but just taking it now and just going to these other verses you can see the underlying principle the eyes of the man are limited our understanding is limited and you and i must be careful when we look with our own natural eyes in fact Hold your hand here. We're going to go back to a passage that we read a, a while back. Isaiah chapter 11. Look at this. Huh. Look at this. Isaiah chapter 11. We were talking about the seven spirits of God the other day. Look at what the Bible says. Verse 2. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And, and, shall, excuse me, and shall make him... Of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, Isaiah 11, verse 3. And he shall not judge after the sight of his, what's it say? Of his eyes. I don't know why the Lord's making me emphasize this, my friends. We cannot trust what we see with our natural eye. They will yield us limited understanding. Perception can be easily tricked and deceived, right? Be careful. So this little horn had eyes like the eyes of man. It was going to lead him ultimately into judgment. The Bible says, Ezekiel 20, verse 7, Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abomination of his eyes, and defile not yourself with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So what is man trying to do? He's trying to see God via this man-created image. Cast him away, he says. Verse, 20, verse 8, But they rebelled against me and would not hearken unto me. They did not every man cast away the abominations of their eyes. Neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. Okay, do you see what we did? So we went through as many passages as we could find with the eyes of man. 
and there's an undergirding principle with the eyes of men that it gets us in trouble. You remember reading, I don't know if you ever read the book of Judges before, but in the book of Judges it says, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Dangerous, my friends. You did like sometimes, you know, we study these prophecies and we they're so broad sometimes we 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 miss out on the practical application of what the Spirit of God is trying to say to his dear children. So here we have it. Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. And let's see what my time is. And I know my one of my cameras is about to go out. So let's make this as efficient as possible. Daniel 7, verse 9 talks about an everlasting kingdom. Let's read this together. Uh, Daniel 7, verse 9 and 10. And what we're doing, my friends, all we're doing, we took all the puzzle pieces out and we put them all on the floor today. That's what we did. We put all the puzzle pieces on the floor. And then we're going to try to put this puzzle together. And we're still putting them on the floor. I mean, when you're done in the book of Daniel, this every chapter is a puzzle piece. Every every line, every it's just an, amu uh, uh, an amazing uh, mural of truth. Okay. Daniel 7, 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was at like the fiery flame, and his feet as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Now, I'm going to emphasize something here. Hopefully, I can do it well. What do we see? We see that in verse 9 and 10, we see a judgment set and a book open. Now, this is unique because we see a lion with wings, first one. We see a leopard with, uh, I'm not sorry, a bear with three ribs in his mouth raised up on one side as number two. We see a leopard with four heads and four wings, number three. We see a dreadful and terrible beast, number four. We see a little horn that plucks up three of the ten horns by the roots and and, it's, and that horn is part of the same fourth power. And then we see judgment. What are we watching? Succession of kingdoms. Succession of kingdoms. I'm going to emphasize something in a moment. I want you to make sure you pay attention. So uh, what do I see? I see kingdoms. I see a judgment set and I see books open. And I see, I see the ancient of days sitting with these books that are open. Verse 11 says, I beheld then, because the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So what does he see? These great words being spoken, and then he sees the end of the story for this fourth beast. That's what he sees. Okay, now, why is it significant that this beast is speaking these great words while there's a judgment? Because this... There's a judgment scene being presented, and then there's this beast speaking great words. Pompous words. Because this beast is speaking words contrary to what's taking place in the heavenly places. Okay? But wait, there's more to this. What is the significance of verse 12? So verse 12 says, As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. What does that mean? So every time Babylon came on the scene or the next kingdom came after that, residue from the previous kingdom went into the next kingdoms. That's, they always continued into the next. It was a constant thing. There's going to be a point, though, when that fourth kingdom is present, the, ten, the, the tendrils of that kingdom go all the way to the end of time. But at that point, none of those kingdoms, nor any essence of those kingdoms, goes into... The kingdom of heaven. When judgment is set, the books are open, everlasting kingdom is set up, there's an end to those kingdoms. Okay. Let's go a little bit further. Who is the son of man? Somebody just give me an answer for that. Who is the son of man? Who is this? That's right, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. The son of man is Jesus. And I want you to take note of this idea. And again, we'll emphasize this more. But you'll notice in Daniel chapter 3, 
Yep, it did it did what I thought it would do. Give me a second. Give me a second, family. Give me a second. In Daniel chapter three. Okay. Is that what you see? What do you see? Yeah. So in Daniel chapter three, it says, one like the Son of God was walking in the midst of the fiery furnace. Remember that? So you have a reference, Son of God is a reference to divinity. Here, it says Son of Man. Son of Man is a reference to the humanity of the divine Son of God. Okay? Very important. And it's very important to keep in mind when it talks about the Son of Man, he is, he is relating to us. I, I I find that to be extremely powerful. He is relating to us. Okay? Because without that, <laughs> it, uh, without that, it, the succession of kingdoms, you have each of these kingdoms are, are human kingdoms. When it comes to this one, it looks like it's divine, but it's divine and human. Because God, the Father, the Ancient of Days, is providing something to his son. Now, let me make sure I want to get to my, my other main point here. Who does the Son of Man come to, and why does he come? All right, let's read this. Pay close attention, because everything I'm sharing with you, my friends, I'm laying such a broad foundation. When we put the whole picture together, when you, in the last days, while you're teaching and preaching, you're not going to be able to reference every verse the way we're doing it right here. Like, the way we're doing it right here... This is this is for our sake to kind of get a deeper anchored understanding, right? But when it comes to us standing before kings and standing before congregations and preaching these sermons and teaching these truths, what's going to happen is the truth will, it's almost like, and I'll tell you how it kind of goes in my mind. Like the way I'm teaching right now is not the way I preach. The way I preach is completely different to how I teach. How I teach is I'll take each point, I lay it out, I'll take my time, I'll go back, I'll think about it, I'll meditate on it, I'll think about it some more, it, and it, it crystallizes, it becomes hardened in my mind. I can see the book of Daniel in my mind without reading all the verses now. I mean, this is years of me doing it, but I can see it in my mind. I know what Daniel 7 is about. I can tell you what it's about, and I can, I can present it in a way that is a, a sermon and is direct to the point. The reason why we're breaking it down this way is because you have to come to a point where you understand it in its essence. And you can't be anchored, move this way and this way. So in this passage, in Daniel 7, it's highlighting Son of Man as what? He is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the one that takes this everlasting kingdom. He is the one that sets this up forever. This is in reference to the kingdom that David spoke about imperative that you set your mind to wrap around these details because they become massively important while the gospel begins to crystallize in your heart and your mind so why does the son of man come verse 13 i saw in the night vision and behold one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him what is given him dominion glory and a kingdom and all peoples nations and languages to serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So let me tell you, let me ask you. Would an everlasting kingdom include an everlasting gospel? Yeah, it would. Absolutely. So now, my friends, I, I want you to begin to, to, like, you need to lock this in because some people have such a narrow view of the gospel that they will miss this. They think the gospel is simply Jesus died on the cross for your sins, which it is a truth and a foundational concept and a foundational reality that Jesus died for your sins. But him dying for your sins is not the end of the gospel. The gospel is good news, meaning that I don't just, I will not just suffer 
or no longer suffer the penalty of sin, which is the 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 if I you know I sin I should die. The wages of sin is death. That's the penalty of sin. Not only should I not suffer the penalty of sin, and not only would I not suffer, not only suffer the presence of sin, but also I will no longer suffer under the power of sin. <laughs> That's all of that is inclusive in the gospel. It's good news. No longer will I be in the presence of sin because the everlasting kingdom has been set up. And you can only have an everlasting kingdom with an everlasting God who has an everlasting law, right? Who gives everlasting life. But there's no such thing as an everlasting kingdom without an everlasting gospel. You understand? So it's good news that there's an everlasting kingdom. There's good news that there's an everlasting gospel. There's a good news that there's an everlasting for everlasting law of God, which he will write in our hearts. So it's good news, my friends. The gospel includes judgment. It includes the establishment of righteousness forever and ever and ever. Of this kingdom, there is no end. Man has tried everything. I mean, we've tried every. Listen, man has tried everything. Babylon tried. Medo Persians tried with his laws. Greece has tried. Rome has tried. Pagan Rome, Papal Rome has tried. United States has tried. China has tried. Uh, uh, the, 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 the great countries within the continent of Africa have tried. The great countries in Europe have tried. Great, the great countries have tried to establish some form of world dominance and world dominion. It's not going to work. The Most High says he's establishing a kingdom. Now, let me emphasize this a bit more. There's, we're going to have a sanctuary class, and we're going to like go even further into this at some point. But let me just emphasize this right now. Here, when, when I read, when you and I read this section, let me go back here. Let me go back to my, my section here. When we go back here, what does the son of, when, who does the son of man come to? He comes to the ancient of days. Right? That's who he comes to. He comes to the Ancient of Days. Hold on. He comes, he comes to the Ancient of Days, and he comes to receive a kingdom. Now, what we're seeing in Daniel 7 is a legal transaction in heaven. What I say it was, my friends? A legal transaction in heaven. So there's something that takes pl place on the books, and then you have the ceremony. You ever, you ever, if you ever got married before, uh, you go down to the courthouse. You know what I'm saying? You get that. You get that paper. Legal transaction. Then you bring that paper to the to proceedings of the ceremony. You see, in heaven, there's a legal proceeding happening, and that legal proceeding is a declaration, here is your kingdom. That proceeding must take place before he comes and gathers his children for that kingdom. Now, I did not make the slide for this, but I guess what I will do, I guess what I will do in this moment is show you. I'm going to show you. If you've been, if you've taken this much time with me, I, I thank you for being patient, but I'm going to show you. Open your Bible now. Before you open it, you already have your Bible open. Go back to Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. I'm going to show you 13 and 14, and then I'm going to take you on a journey to the book of Revelation, and I'm going to show you a progression, a progression. So in Daniel 7, 13, the Bible says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man. This is our Messiah. <laughs> One like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and brought him near before him. Hold your finger here. Go to Revelation chapter 14. Look with me at verse number 13. And all we're doing is touching, my friends. I'm not, we're not explaining deeply. We're just touching. Watch what the Bible says. 
Revelation 14, we're looking at verse 14. The Bible says, Revelation 14, verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Have we seen that before? Yes, we just saw it in Daniel 7, verse 13, where it says, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. Go back, Revelation 14. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one set like unto the Son of, what's it say? Son of Man. Having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Wait, that's different. He has a crown on his head. He has a sickle in his hand. Well, Daniel 7 didn't have a, a crown on his head, and he doesn't have a sickle. Well, you know why? Because in Daniel 7, he goes in to receive his kingdom. But in Revelation 14, he has the right to his kingdom now, and he's coming to get his kingdom. That's why he has a crown on his head, and that's why he has a sharp sickle to gather his harvest. All right. All right. I'm hoping you're following me here. So let's let's go back here. The judgment is set. The books are open. <laughs> the Angel of Days is sitting. And it's in this moment in time, friends, that humanity, this is, in, in fact, without me telling you when this is happening, because this is not the purpose of the passage. All right, the purpose of the passage is to show you that there is a transfer of power. Babylon, the bear beast, the leopard beast, dreadful and terrible beast. Oh, someone's going to receive a kingdom. While he's receiving his kingdom, his children, his children, while he's receiving his kingdom, his children are to be in preparation to make sure that they're part of that same kingdom. So I have a thought here. It says, I thought it's emphasis, the investigative judgment. So what we're doing, and uh, uh, Sister Diana, I wanted to make sure that everybody understood this. We're approaching this as if we don't know what we know in Daniel 8 and Daniel 9 and 10. We are only approaching this as if the focus is right here in this chapter, and the ch right here in this chapter is Christ receiving a kingdom, but before he receives the kingdom, there is this judgment, and we have to make sure that we're in alignment with what he's doing in the heavenly places. Go ahead, Sister Diana. Oh, because there is a mention of the books were open, so that um, gives me the idea that that's the book for investigation. Absolutely. And we, we highlighted that in verse 9 and 10, that the judgment is set and the books are open. And this is, this is a proceeding that takes place as Jesus goes to claim his children. Thank you for that. So I, I just want you guys to understand that because before there's an establishment of, let me back up, let me back up before this. Uh, let me see if I, if I did this on the screen. Let me show you something. I'm going to try to illustrate my thought. I'm going to come back to that. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. I'll come back to these. Come back. Come back. Okay. I'm going to illustrate my thought with this. So on the screen, you're going to have an arc that develops. So that arc, let's say that's the first kingdom. That's, that's Babylon. Okay. This red dot is an indication that there's another kingdom in development, even though Babylon is in its apex. So while the Babylon is in its apex, another kingdom is organizing, right? And that other kingdom rises up. But while that kingdom rises up and comes to its apex, there's another kingdom that's organizing. Even though it's not at its apex yet, it's still there. It's still present. So the next kingdom comes up. And the same thing happens for the next kingdom. There's another power in preparation, developing, whether that's Alexander the Great or whomever. There's always a power developing secretly developing and growing in power and so each one at its apex there's always another power going there so when we're talking in uh, daniel chapter 7 i want you to know and emphasize the idea let me go back 
that each of these kingdoms, again, don't worry about the names that I, you know, that are here, but each of these kingdoms, yes, 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 this is what I want to use. Perfect. Look at this. Let me switch up for a second. I want full screen. All right. So notice this. In Daniel 2, the only kingdom that's mentioned by name is Babylon. You are the head of gold, right? Nebuchadnezzar, this is your kingdom. Daniel 2 says, chest and arms of silver. It's another kingdom, inferior. Daniel, the third kingdom says, belly and thighs of brass, another third of brass. So now we have a number. So the first two don't are not given numbers, but the third one is given the number third, which means the pre preceding ones are two and one. Then it says legs of iron, fourth kingdom as strong as, as iron. Again, this imagery is telling you, and the language is telling you numerically what they are. Then there's one's feet and toes, iron and clay, partly strong, partly weak, seed of men mingled, but not cleaving to each other. And then we have a stone cut out of a mountain without hands, everlasting gospel, grows into a great mountain, fills the entirety of the earth. These are the succession of kingdoms with only one kingdom named, but the other kingdoms numbered. You follow? Because you remember in creation, what, what happened in creation? The first day, the second day, the third day. There were no names except for when it came to the Sabbath. The seventh day is the Sabbath. That name was not even given in creation. The name was pronounced in, in clarity in uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11. But the name Sabbath was not there. Okay? But the seventh day. Okay. Reason why I'm emphasizing this because we're going to build to know where the correlations lie. So in Daniel 7, it says the first was like a lion. It says the second was like a bear. It doesn't give a number for the third, but it does give a number for the fourth. The fourth was a dreadful and terrible beast. Okay? You can see that the legs are of iron in that chapter 2, and you see that the teeth are of iron in chapter 7. These show connection and correlation. So somebody can't just come and make up stuff. Like I've seen somebody come and say, like, oh, Babylon, that is, uh, that is uh, Iran today. Uh, no, friends. No, that's, that is not what that is. These happen in succession, one after the other. One after after the other i also want you to note that the fourth kingdom and the feet of iron and clay are considered one in prophecy the terrible beast the little horn comes out of the fourth they're considered one they are trans they transform they adjust but they're considered the same please understand that and that this power goes all the way down to the judgment in chapter 7 and goes all the way down to the mountain. I mean, the stone that's cut out without hands that grows into a great mountain. These are observations that you can have for yourself. It's very, very clear. Very clear. Very clear. Now, in response to this power, in chapter 7, judgment is set. In response to this power, a stone's cut out without hands. So the stone cut out without hands and the judgment is set are correlative in nature. Okay? They go together. They go together. So what you and I would do, if I'm a, if I'm a, a thinking man and you are a thinking man or a thinking woman, you would say, okay, when did Babylon rule? And then you put dates here. And I said, what kingdom came after that? And you'll put dates there. And then you'll say, does this kingdom have anything to do with actual silver? Right? And then you would ask the question, does the kingdom that comes after Babylon have anything to do with one being lopsided? Why would one be lopsided? Like, why is that? And why does it have three ribs in his mouth? What is the significance of three ribs in his mouth in the next kingdom that comes up after Babylon? Right? And then you'd be like, so after that kingdom, what came up after that? And what's the significance of four heads in that kingdom? Like, those are the questions that you would d deduce as you're going through and making your comparisons and correlations. All right. So let's back up for a second. 
I want I want to end on a a point in that Sister uh, Diana brought out that I want to make sure we emphasize. As the Most High is in his final work here. When I call it his final work. When he's setting up his eternal kingdom here. When he's receiving the kingdom from his father here. When your name and my name comes up in those books. Our experience comes up in those books. We must have truly surrendered everything of ourselves to Jesus as our Messiah. And I mean in every aspect of our experience. And when I say experience, I'm talking about our families, finances, our fun, our faith, uh, 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 food, uh, whatever you can think of. <laughs> His 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 converting influence of his spirit must have reign in every aspect of our lives because what's the challenge? The challenge is the devil says, guess what? He's the ruler of this planet. He his laws reign. His kingdom's gonna last forever. Who's gonna make war with this beast? Who's going to dominate him? These are the questions that are going to be asked and the challenge that's going to come to the people of God. Now, the timing of this judgment is not our concern at this moment. The import of this judgment is our concern. Because the books are open, and when they're open, when your name comes up, I pray your name and your, your life is not seen I pray that your name and your life is covered by the blood of Jesus. And when they look at the actions of your life, they see Jesus living through you in this world on planet Earth. So we, we went through a lot of details. We covered a lot of information. But if I were to put this succinctly, it's a succession of kingdoms. And Jesus is in the process of receiving an eternal kingdom legally before he comes back through the clouds to receive us literally does that make sense everybody i hope that makes sense to you on next week we're going to look at a more even a more succinct way of looking at this chapter and then we're going to go to chapter eight the following week but i wanted to go over it this way because i needed to put those details out there and lay them before you and show you how Show you how Daniel Daniel did not see everything that we see. Daniel only saw the limited verses that we saw, and he saw the Old Testament verses. He didn't see Revelation. That was not part of his. That was not part of his thing. What he saw was this. He didn't see that we we know what the names of the next kingdoms are. That's not what he saw. What he saw is what we presented to you today. And the question is, a. What is the truth of this fourth beast? Why did it bother him so much? And B, how did God respond to the question that Daniel gave? And the import of understanding how he answered will tell us what we need to do today, my friends. Today. All right. Before we close out, I just want to open the floor for any questions. Does anyone have any questions on what we covered? I'm quite sure there was a lot of information presented any question <laughs> yes uh, i i appreciate the um comparison the, that the son of man came to the ancient of days is to make up the number of his kingdom to determine who are the subjects and then once that's determined when he comes the second time he takes those subjects with him amen that's right um, may I ask, I see flashing at the bottom that uh, you, to sign up for the How to Study the Bible class, the URL. Uh, so that's what we give to those who are interested, or you have a link? I, I have a link that I'm going to send you guys tomorrow morning. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other thoughts, questions, or concerns? We covered a lot.
Everybody's good? <laughs> we covered a lot. I appreciate you guys coming. Um, we will go over this again, but in a different way uh, because very good. We're going we're gonna to be adding some pieces here. I want you to be able to, in your own way, be able to explain this to others. My job is just to present as much information as possible, and you learn to piece it together. Almost like you know how you know how um, David had his own armor, right? You 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 don't need to preach Daniel seven like Mark Finley does, or David Ashrick, or whomever your favorite preacher is, right? Daniel seven, you need to own it yourself. Go into the text, own the text, look at the passages. I'm not, I'm not saying to make up something because if they do it well, you do you follow that example. But I am saying you own it yourself. Look at the text, look at the passages, and understand the import of what is being emphasized by the scripture, the scriptures themselves. All right, any other thoughts? No, everybody's good. All right, before we before I let you go, I want to make sure. My friends, I, I I appreciate being able to teach you guys these different things and spend time with you um, investigating the truths of the scripture. Uh, some of you are full-time students in my in our program. Some of you are in this course doing this one for free. Um, and what we ultimately want to do, I'm going to tell you my goal. My goal is to, to teach and train at least 1,000 people this year and to open up our training program for as many as people as possible. And in order to do that, I'm gonna need your help. Uh, I, I understand the economy's tough. Many hands make light work, they say. So in order for us to do our mission project the way we need to do it, we have four areas of, of service that we do as a mission. We have our educational platform that we have here. We invite you guys to come to our, our campus. We are going to have an on-campus um, event here in the in the late spring early summer so look out for announcement for that we have our overseas work we're actually building a missionary school and uh, in one of these beautiful countries and it doesn't cost as much as it does to run a school here as it does there but it does cost and so we're looking for help to establish that we have our TV and podcasts and we also have our mission center here in, in the States. And we're looking for ambassadors, folks that will be willing to assist us uh, in the development of this. So we're looking for at least 10 folks to give a thousand a month, a hundred folks to give a hundred a month, uh, 200 folks to give 50 a month, 500 to give 25, a thousand to give 10. Anything you give, my friends, helps us keep going. Like I cannot do this without your assistance. Uh, all these classes that we teach on Sunday nights and Sundays and the, the private conversations that we have um, when you call me and we talk. Uh, I wish all that could pay for my food on the table, but I, I, <laughs> I wish it could just translate into money when it's done, but it doesn't. So every little bit that you give is huge for us and we need your assistance. Uh, if you've been blessed by what you've been hearing and you can only give a dollar, I'll take it because every dollar helps us meet our responsibilities and our needs. So I, I encourage you, if you can, if you will, if you would be so kind to assist us in advancing the cause of God. We want to get better and better at our broadcasts. Um, a lot of the things that I do myself, you know, if I had a team in here, it would go way better. Um, there's a lot of things that we could do to, to make our presence on the social media is much better. There's a lot of things we could do for our children. We have 150 students in in uh, one of our countries. I, I don't always want to say the name because I don't want to get folks in trouble out there. But we have 150 young people out that way. And we need to provide housing for them, food for them, clothing for them, pay for their teachers. Can't do all of that by ourselves. So we need your help. And I plead, if you can help us, please take the time to go to our website and do so. Uh, myfaithinstitute.com. You can click on that donate button and uh, choose whatever you want to give to assist us to carry that forward. So that is that, my friends. I appreciate you guys. This is probably going to be posted in two days. It takes a couple of 
I don't know, several hours for, for it to be migrated through the um, recording that we have going on YouTube. And so it takes me a bit of time to get that edited and put it out there. So if there are no other questions, I, I do want to pause. If there are any questions, any questions, any questions or concerns? Actually, I am curious <laughs> why <clears throat> the Roman power for the little horn in Daniel is later in Revelation named as Babylon. Or why is it not called Rome or Roman? Or... So ask the question again. Yeah. Ask the question again, please. Now, um, the little horn in Daniel, or the Roman power in Daniel, is in Revelation parallel to Babylon, that great city, the harlot. I, I thought it's interesting why the, the name is changed. Okay, so so what we haven't done yet is name any of these kingdoms, right? So I haven't named Rome, per se, or Babylon, Greece. Those are... those. We will prove those things, and you will understand exactly why the names are the way they are. So I will, we will prove that uh, going forward. But to make it simple, in Revelation, whenever it uses the phraseology Babylon, it is talking about the characteristic of Babylon, right? So when we're naming names in Daniel, we're actually telling you the real names of the actual kingdoms in Babylon when we actually name them. But in Revelation, when it says Babylon, it's not naming the literal kingdom of Babylon. It's highlighting the characteristics of Babylon. So you can go back to Babylon and see what is the main issue with Babylon. Pride. Who is the father of pride? That's Lucifer, the devil. Why was he kicked out of heaven? Because of pride. So that's why that becomes an emphasis in the book of Revelation, because the name is symbolic of characteristics that this nation or, or this end time kingdom takes upon itself. Is that, does that make any sense to you? Yes, thanks. You are welcome. I love answering questions, guys. Yes, my friend Naomi. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, regarding the Bible memory app. Um, you said that you've been posting the verses you need to memorize in the app, but I seem to be unable 